We know that God is love, but we also know that there are some things that God hates. We're going to talk about that just a little bit today and other stuff that's in the news. I'm Randall Terry. This is Voice of Resistance. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked. Those who uphold the law resist them. Welcome to the Voice of Resistance. Welcome to the program, friend. I'm going to read to you from the book of Proverbs, chapter 6. There are six things which the Lord hates, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and a man who sows discord among brothers. Wow, these things make God upset and they are really detrimental to the human race. Feet that rush to evil, false witnesses breathing out lies, like we saw, for example, against President Trump. Literally, MSNBC and CNN made a a living out of breathing out lies that President Trump colluded with the Russians to win the election. It was all a lie. And many of them knew they were lying false witnesses. But the one I wanted to focus on today was a man who sows discord among brothers. Now, I I have been watching the news as part of what I do, as much as I don't like it. Did you see that Elon Musk hosted Saturday Night Live? Now, put the picture up of him. So when I was a boy, and as in my whole in my whole life, that symbol or the symbol that sign meant okay. That's all it ever meant. See, look at me. This means okay. If you're across the field with somebody, you go like that. Okay, everything is good. Okay. It's an American symbol. So somehow, somewhere, I don't know the origin of it. I it seems so insane to me. There are now young people who believe that it's an insider's white supremacy signal. That Elon Musk, when he was at the end of a bit on Saturday Night Live and people were laughing and he went like that, like, I got it, I nailed it, it's okay. But he was sending out a white racist sign, a white supremacy sign. How, here's here's what perplexes me. How do you have an intelligent conversation with people like that? (laughs) I don't know that you can. All right, so now couple that with the news about Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow is, you know, everyone's favorite football player. And I don't mean everyone, obviously, but there's a lot of homeschoolers, a lot of devout evangelicals who just love Tim Tebow because he's got a great testimony. He, He genuinely is a nice man. Now, I used to say young, nice young man. I got to see him speak when he was a teenager, when, I, when we lived in the Jacksonville, Florida area. Well, as it turns out, it looks like the Jacksonville Jaguars football team are going to sign him for a one-year contract to play tight end. So now, once again, there are people on the left, false witnesses, sowing discord, screaming their lungs out, how come Tebow is getting a job back in the NFL, but not Kaepernick? Because the NFL is racist. They're helping out a white guy, but they don't want a black guy. You know, Kaepernick, the one who started the whole thing about kneeling during the national anthem at football games. Now, interestingly, Joe Montana, when this whole thing broke like three years ago, Joe Montana said, that he was the quarterback for the 49ers, took them to three or four Super Bowls. Joe Montana said, if if Kaepernick was in our locker room, he would have been dismissed. The coach would have gotten rid of him immediately. And it wouldn't have mattered how talented he was. Because the coach wanted what? Unity. The coach wanted the team to be unified. He didn't want distraction. 
He wanted everyone to have their head in the game, and we are here to play football, and we are here to win at football, and we are here to go to the Super Bowl if humanly possible. He that sows discord among brethren. So here's the question. Here we are, we're having a great day, we're going along on our day, and then we hear Elon Musk is a racist and he sent a racist signal, white supremacy signal. And we flip through the channel on the news. And then we hear that Tim Tebow is going to get maybe a one-year contract playing tight end. Big, you know, big, hard-working, weightlifting guy. And it's because the Jaguars are racist and the NFL is racist. It's just so, you know, so you're looking over your shoulder. Critical race theory. The new boogeyman in the room that all of America's major institutions are inherently racist. If two people are in your store, one is black and one is white. If you serve the black person first, it's because you don't want him left alone in your store. And if you serve the white person first, it's because you're a racist and black people are second-class citizens. In other words, you're a racist no matter what. These people are sowing discord and and part of our duty in moments like this, and, and I know that... um. What I'm going to say, let me take a break, and I'll say it when I come back, how you deal with people like this. One of the critical options. Please, please, don't go away. Welcome back, friend. There's a proverb that says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Now, I have a limited amount of time, and there are some people that are watching this program who have more time. In other words, I've got teenage sons, I've got business to run, I've got all kinds of stuff going on. So I don't have time to respond to a lot of these insane, divisive, seed-sowing, discord-sowing journalists out there. But there are people who do. And then there are people who can do it in person. So if you get in a discussion with someone in person or you get in a discussion with somebody online or in a a letter to the editor or whatever, answer the fool according to his folly and then just say, you're an idiot. You are literally a stupid human being. You are a fool. You think you're wise. You're wise in your own eyes, but you're an idiot. For you to think that this is a secret white supremacy symbol means you are an idiot. You're stupid. You're not intelligent. You're not clever. You're an idiot. You're not well read. You might be crying and you might be like a teapot whistle going off and gets everyone's attention. All right. That can be really annoying. You can be a very annoying person and I'll grant that you're annoying, but you're an idiot. One guy who said, to explain to me like I was a five-year-old. No, he, why Tebow gets a, a job and Copernic doesn't in the NFL. Explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old, this guy says. He's, some, he's a writer for, I don't, I don't remember, one of the New York-based or London-based magazines. Explain it to me like I was a five-year-old. You're not as smart as a five-year-old. A five-year-old could grasp it. This man plays better than this man. This man fills a need on this team for a tight end. This man doesn't fill a need for any team right now. Well, it's because he's black. No, this man fills a need. This man doesn't fill a need. So little Mr. Five-Year-Old, do you need a pair of sneakers? Yes, okay, I'm gonna get you a pair of sneakers. Do you need big size 12 boots, cowboy boots? No, you don't need them? Okay. That's how you would explain it to a five-year-old who had sense, but you're such a moron, you couldn't grasp that. You want to see racism. You want to stir up trouble. You want to sow seeds of discord. You have feet that are swift to run to evil. You have a mouth that breathes out lies, false witness. It's as natural to you as breathing. I would rather explain it to a five-year-old because most five-year-olds aren't so corrupted. 
They're not idiots. You can teach a five-year-old. You can teach a five-year-old right from wrong, truth from lies, good from evil. But somebody like you who's sitting there saying, it's because Tebow's white and because Copernic is black. That's why Tebow's got a job. Oh, what could it be that, hmm, it's a business decision. Tebow's from North Florida. Tebow literally grew up in that area. He has fans coming out of the woodwork. And let me think, hold on a second. I think I've got this. The NFL is a business. Mm -hmm. Tickets are actually going to be sold by, by the Jaguars to people who just want to see Tebow play because they love Tebow. I mean, that, that's really how business works, supply and demand. Now, I know that I didn't get it down dumb enough for you, the, the man. I did. I know I didn't. But friends, let's come back to you, the viewer. You need to be aggressive in this. You need to be aggressive. These people who say that we've got to defund the police, that police, uh, all police forces are inherently racist. These people are insane. These, these critical race theory people, these, these people who are harping about Elon Musk and Copernic and Tebow, they are insane. They're stupid. They're illiterate. They're ignorant. They're asinine. And you can use as colorful a language as you feel permitted. You can't obviously use the name of the Lord in vain. That's a, that's a sin against the commandments. But you can use whatever language you feel comfortable with to confront and expose these people and to ridicule them. Because we're in a situation in America right now where it's getting so insane I mean, literally insane. You tell a little girl at eight years old that she can be a boy if she wants? Tell a little boy at eight years old he can be a girl if he wants? This is insane, and it's got an evil twist that's demonic to it, okay? Things are getting so insane that it's like the emperor's new clothes. And the court and the courtiers and the media give give uh, the, the stamp of credibility. Yes, the Empress clothes are indeed beautiful. Some of the finest fabric we've ever seen. Yes, the NFL is inherently racist. That's why Tebow's got the job. Yes, we did in fact see that secret white supremacy sign coming from Elon Musk. Doesn't the Emperor look beautiful in those new garments? And the little boy says, <laughs> he's naked. What? And maybe it is the role of the five-year-old. I don't, I, you know, I know that that one guy said, explain it to me like I was a five-year-old. Maybe it's the five-year-old that needs to explain it to you. The emperor's naked, you moron. There's not good fabric on him. He's a fat, blubbering idiot. And his flesh is hanging out there, the disgusting flesh for everyone to see. We need people to be like the little boy who points and laughs. <laughs> He's naked! I'll be right back. Welcome back to the program, friend. I was reading some Winston Churchill quotes yesterday. Gosh, I love Winston Churchill. What a great hero. These books you see behind me, these little Churchill head, I don't know if it's in the shot or not. Is it in the shot? I've been to his home three times, Chartwell, outside of London. I just love Winston Churchill. It was arguably the most towering figure of the entire 20th century. And he, he talked in some of his speeches about the value of courage. Because in my opinion, courage is the chief virtue. And Churchill said this in his own words. My words is that courage is the chief virtue because it propels the other virtues into action when they're needed. If you know what the truth is, but you don't have the courage to say it, then what good is knowing the truth? And one of the quotes that Churchill said was, courage is being willing to stand up and say what you believe. And it's also having the courage to sit down and listen. That was a great quote. 
So we're desperate in America right now for courage, but I don't think that we're that desperate to have people who sit down and listen. I don't think that we need to have the courage to sit down and listen to critical race theory for an hour or two hours and to really take into our souls what a racist country we really are to this day. Never mind how many African-American officials in our cities, in our states, the chiefs of police, the president of the United States, so what? Having a black man as a president of the United States doesn't prove anything. Yeah, okay, so you, logic doesn't matter with these people. That's the issue, logic doesn't matter. They hate logic, they cannot follow a logical thought. But here's what's even worse than their illogic, or in my opinion, this is worse, is the silence of Christians and the silence of our clergy. I, I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, but in the 80s, I was, late 80s, early 90s, I was the most famous pro-life leader in the Western Hemisphere. The only person who would have been more famous than me would have been Mother Teresa, literally, as far as being a pro-life activist. I mean, obviously she wasn't a pro-life activist, but she really stirred the pot. So did John Paul II. So I was, I got to this place where I would speak the truth. I called the head of one of the pro-abortion groups, uh, Kate Michaelman. I said, she's a liar and she knows she's lying. On Meet the Press, Sunday morning. And Bob, uh, see, what was his name? Anyway, he said, his eyes were like this when the segment came to a close and he said, I've been doing this a long time, but I've never heard another guest call one of our guests a liar. <laughs> he was so shocked. But Kate Michaelman was lying. And I wasn't going to pretend that she wasn't lying. So we're desperate in America right now for Christians, for clergy, especially our pastors, but for rank and file brothers and sisters in Christ. We are desperate for people to just have the courage to say the truth. And I submit to you, my brothers and sisters, that the mess we're in, and we're in a mess, okay, the mess we're in is in part, and I would proffer in large part, because of the collaboration of clergy. Clergy aren't silent. They have to preach every Sunday, right? Whatever denomination you're in, if you're an evangelical, you're expected to give a good sermon 30 to 60 minutes long. If you're a good Catholic priest, you're expected to give a homily that lasts eight to 12 minutes. But you're still expected to say something. And if you live in a community that's going off the rails, like so many of our communities are, you could just have a press conference and you could get a bunch of clergy and people together and have a rally or a protest or a press conference and speak the truth about any number of issues that are really critical to God and his kingdom. But most clergy, not all, most clergy are not doing it. They don't want to do it. They refuse to do it. Is the show over? Are we out of time? Oh, we're going to take a break. All right. I thought we have one more segment. I will be right back. But if you, I would encourage you, go to my YouTube channel. Those of you that are watching this on television, real TV stations, go to my YouTube channel, find this show, and send a link. Send a link to your pastor. Send a link to your Bible teacher. See what they think. I'll be right back. Welcome back, friend. We know that God hates hands that shed innocent blood, feet that are swift to, to commit evil, and lying witnesses, and those that store or stir up discord among brethren. And there's a passage in the scriptures where God says, who will rise up for me against evildoers. Who will rise up for me against the workers of iniquity? Now, it's when you read the text, it's, it's tough to discern if it's David saying it or if it's God saying it through David. But the question is there. Who will rise up for me against the workers of iniquity? 
In Isaiah chapter 6, we have, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah is saying, here am I, send me. We have Jesus in the gospel saying, the fields are white unto harvest. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he sends forth laborers. How blessed are the feet of them that bring good news. So much about Christianity and truth involves speaking. The gospel, the good news, it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for our sins, an event that happened in time and history, but the gospel is spread by words. Who will rise up for me? Friend, Christian, pastor, God's asking, who will rise up for me against the workers of iniquity? And my prayer is that we respond the way Isaiah responded. Here am I, Lord. Send me.